We want to come today to uh, Paul's letter to Galatians, and I want to just read three uh, sections from it, just to focus our mind and to remind us of some of his emphases. So just a selection from chapter 1, verse 6, chapter 3, and uh, going into chapter 4. Chapter 1, verse 6, Paul writes to the Galatians. He's just given his usual introduction to a letter, but he forgets to go say thank you, which he normally does at this point. And instead of saying thank you to them, he says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let that person be under God's curse. As we've already said, so I say now again, if anybody is preaching you a gospel other than what you accepted, let that person be under God's curse. Chapter 3, verse 21. 23. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until faith, the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was put in charge of us until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we're no longer under the supervision of the law. So, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as you are, as long as heirs, under, uh, uh, as long as heirs are under age, they are no different from slaves, although they own the whole estate. They are subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by their fathers. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the time set, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might be receive adoption to sonship. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, and God and the spirit who calls out Abba. Father, so you are no longer slaves, but God's children, and since you are his children, he has made you also heirs. Formerly, when you didn't know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years, I fear for you that somehow I've wasted my efforts upon you. May the Lord make this book come alive to us to his glory today. We want to use Galatians in the same way that we were using Colossians yesterday as a model outlining principles involved in adequate contextualization. We do so because I believe that that's exactly what Paul was doing in the letter. He was seeking to grapple with the issues about understanding the gospel in the light of what was going on in this church at that time. And he gives a very powerful example of how to handle the particular issues of a particular setting at a particular time. I'm going to do things a little bit different, apart from the first few slides where we're doing a little bit of introduction. Um, the following slides will not be exactly what I'm saying. Some of you who are New Testament experts will probably know the book Elements of New Testament Exegesis by Michael Gorman. In his latest revision of that, setting out how to interpret the scriptures, he suggests, as is common to suggest these days, it's been a wonderful change in scholarly circles generally, to say that it's not enough to do exegesis. It's not enough to get all your hermeneutics right. You need to go on from that to do theological interpretation of the scriptures. 
And so there's this whole new school of studying the scriptures of theological education, which has brought the attention back to what do we learn about God and what is God saying to us in the scripture once you've done the exegesis. And I've been trying to do that a little bit the last couple of days. But Gorman in his revised version, his latest 2005 edition, actually says, but just doing theological interpretation isn't enough because you have to actually make sure you go from the theological interpretation to the goal of theological interpretation, which is missiological interpretation. So until you find out the missional application of the scripture, you haven't really got to the heart of it. Amen. That's what I like to hear. And, but of course, not too many New Testament scholars have caught up with um, him or lots of others yet, but we're trying hard. We're trying to make it that people realize that's the case. So what I'm really doing today is we'll be doing two things. On the screen, you'll see what was actually in the notes, the outline of the exegesis of the passage. But I'll actually be presenting something of a more missiological reflection on each passage as we go through it. So there'll be a bit of disconnect between what's actually on the screen and the things I'm actually saying, although I hope you'll be able to see from what is on the screen that what I'm doing is bringing the missional implications of each of those sections. All right? I think you'll get what I'm saying as we go along. All right, just one or two introductory comments. Um, A bit of the background, which I'm sure most of you all know, so I will go quickly. Um, You know where uh, Galatia is on the map. Probably can show you here. The Roman province of Galatia. Paul had visited on his first missionary journey from Antioch in Syria here. He'd gone to these places, <coughs> Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra and Derbe. These were the three, or, Pisidia, or Antioch and Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra and Derbe. These were the places where he established the Galatian churches on his first missionary journey. They were in what's commonly referred to as the south of the Galatian province. Different people use the term Galatia in different ways, whether you're talking about the old kingdom of Galatia or the Roman province of Galatia. And so there's lots of arguments but, uh, about what, which places are being referred to. But it's these churches here that were receiving this letter that Paul is writing. He had just recently uh, founded them on his first missionary journey, which we read about in, uh, in Acts chapters 13 and 14. Um, you'll remember the details. I don't really need to go through it in any detail. The author, obviously, of the letter is Paul. It's probably, well, the recipients were those churches we've just seen. The date was about 49 AD. I want to put it there, just after their missionary journey, just before the conference in Jerusalem. The occasion was that there had been a reaction of Jewish Christians in Jerusalem to the first wave of non-Jewish Christian converts. We read about it specifically in Acts 15, 1 to 3. So a delegation from Jerusalem had gone down to, um, or sorry, whichever way you think about the world, um, had gone to Antioch in Syria, um, and they were telling the uh, people in Syria that they needed to put the Jewish understanding of the Old Testament and the teachings about circumcision and the food laws and the rituals associated with those, they needed to be added on to their faith in Christ if they were to be truly the people of God. This led to a real argument in the church in Antioch, and so the church called for a a conference to take place, the church in Antioch called for a conference to take place in Jerusalem, and Paul and Barnabas were appointed to attend it. They'd just come back from um, their, their missionary journey. There'd been this big debate in the Antioch church and they're just about to go to the conference in Jerusalem. But it seems that right at that point, Paul gets news that another group of Jewish Christians had gone from Jerusalem to those new Galatian churches and they were saying to these new churches in Galatia exactly what they had been arguing about in the church at Antioch. They were telling them too that they needed to add the Jewish customs on top of the faith in Christ that they'd already expressed and found a new life through. So they were saying that new converts need the Jewish laws and circumcision to be true Christians, and they were at least implying, if they weren't saying it outright, Paul wasn't really one of the original Jerusalem apostles, so his teaching didn't quite have full authority, but we've come to you from Jerusalem, so we need to put things straight. And so the new churches are now in real turmoil in Galatia 
Paul's about to go to Jerusalem to talk about it and try to sort it out. He can't go back to the churches, so what does he do? He sits down and writes this very rushed letter, which, as you saw from the beginning of it, has got a fair bit of emotion behind it. Right, you got the feel and the setting? Now, in other words, for the scholars, I'm taking the South Galatian theory clearly. I'm very well aware of the North Galatian theory, but I still think that F.F. F. Bruce's original, or not original, his earlier arguments still hold true despite everything that's been said in the last 25 or 30 years. And uh, interesting, I think the majority of scholars are swinging back that way in any case. It's an aside if you get worried. So Paul rushes off this letter to Galatia, the Galatian churches and then he goes up to thrash it all out in the Jerusalem conference. Okay, the letter addresses the big question. Must one dominant culture's way of expressing the gospel be embraced and copied without change in every other culture in the world? That's the big issue. And the Galatian letter is the one letter in the New Testament specifically dealing with this issue of contextualization in this kind of situation, where the gospel had been introduced by representatives from a culture with its own strong Jewish religious heritage into a setting where some Jewish, Jewish proselytes and God-fearing converts had also previously adopted much of that same Jewish religious heritage, but many of the Gentile converts had not. The letter addresses this basic issue raised for the early church by Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey, which had effectively established the new churches in the Roman province of Galatia. As we mentioned, this unexpected group of new Gentile converts had raised this question, and <clears throat> the teachers from Jerusalem, who had gone both to Antioch and to the Galatian churches, they took the answer to that question to be very obvious. They were the people who had right through the generations of their history been called the chosen people of God. They were the ones who had the law and they had been cherishing it down through the centuries and they knew how to be the people of God. And so therefore, surely, any other people who are being converted into this new way of Christ, if they have found the Messiah, well, it's the Jewish Messiah they found, they must be schooled in the things that go with following the Jewish way. And they're absolutely certain that the answer to that question is yes. Clearly, we've got all this Old Testament heritage. They need to understand it and embrace it if they want to be true followers of, of Christ, of the Messiah, and if they want to be truly the people of God. As Paul writes his letter, um, he answers it, as we've seen in Colossae, with a series of carefully developed phases or arguments all the way through the book. And he says a number of things that if I was directly answering that, I wouldn't have put on the agenda. But that's because I was not in tune with the, the Spirit of God in quite the way that, that Paul was. So again, to find the answer, we need to listen to each of the sections of the letter and to hear what's the point that he's making about this question in the way he builds up his letter. <clears throat> Why do this? Well, for the obvious reasons that right around the world, wherever missionaries go, what happened in this situation happens again. Because invariably, when the gospel comes as a new message with all its good news value into a new culture, it's brought by a messenger from somewhere else. It has to happen that way. God ordained it way. That's what you begin called the logic of election. If you are chosen by God to be his people, then you've got a responsibility to go and take the gospel to others. And whether you like it or not, or they like it or not, you're going to be a foreigner as you bring that message. There's no other way to get it. But historically, the fact is also true that every time that's happened, the foreigners who bring the message have bought more than the message. They've bought the message and their way of understanding it and their way of expressing it. And so, naturally, the first converts are always in the same tension. Do we just receive the heart of the message and make it our own in our own way, or do we have to copy exactly the way the foreigner who brought us the message had it? And in most places today, not only is the foreigner who brought the message coming from the Western world, but many people in the receiving culture have already started to copy many of the ways from the Western world, 
and they already think that the Western world's got a whole lot of advantages that they want and the gospel will help them to get more of it. Hear what I'm saying? So this is not just an old-fashioned question, but it is the missiological issue. It's the, message, the mission question par excellence. It's the one which comes above most other issues that come up in mission. And the whole letter is written to try to grapple with that. And so we want to hear it clearly. So once again, as we did yesterday, we find a series of principles to evaluate our own contextualizing because we need to check with what Paul does here against the way we go about doing it and ask, are we following the same kind of questions? That's what I'm trying to do today. All right. The first principle, and this is where what I'll say now won't follow exactly what's on the, on the, letter, on the screen there. Keeping loyal to the apostolic gospel as universally acceptable for all cultures is the first thing that Paul stresses. And you heard from what I read in chapter 1 there, Paul's very strong in his opening section about the fact that there is one and only one gospel, and it is the one that the first apostles spoke when they first went. And so, in any contextualizing, this message has to be central and fundamental and has to be accepted without distortion or addition in such a way that it changes. So the apostolic teaching of the gospel is upheld in the first section of the letter as the unique and unchanging standard for every cultural setting. Adequate contextualization needs to address the issues relating to authority and matters of faith. Right at the outset, Galatians declares that apostolic authority is the foundation for contextualization in all cultures. Apostolic authority must be upheld and expressed in the contextualization task. There is a givenness about the New Testament statement of the good news which give it a def definite shape and content which is not simply open to adaptation or alteration at the whim of the contextualizing agent. This section of Galatians warns against turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. The danger of this that put the apostles are pointing here is that inevitably adding to the gospel or trying to take away from some of the heart of it changes things in such a way that grace is lost. It inevitably puts other things in place of the free grace of God giving us salvation in Christ. This is what he's concerned about. He talks about the different sources from which such false teaching can come. He talks about the seriousness of it. He says, even if I came back to you and start telling you something else, well then God's curse should be upon me. He's not saying these things because he's upset another group of people have come and are running over his patch and he wants to push them out again. There's none of that at all, although that's what many scholars would suggest. No, no, he's concerned because even if he went back and changed it, he knows he'd be under the curse of God. What was given was the truth and it has to be accepted as such. So, as we've said, this biographical reflection in the first section of Galatians reminds us that in any contextualization of the Christian message, Faithfulness to the apostolic gospel as set out in the New Testament is essential. Distortion of the Christian message can arise through willfully or unconsciously adding requirements to the message that was first received, often on the basis of apparently significant new spiritual experiences. Distortion also easily develops from either neglect or overemphasis of aspects of the message. Upholding the apostolic gospel as the one and only standard for teaching in every culture challenges postmodern assumptions that meta-narratives are necessarily exploitative. The apostle insists that imposing a single culture's religious rituals <coughs> is hegemonic and exploitative, but not the gospel meta-narrative. The gospel provides a meta-narrative that actually frees every different cultural situation to become itself in a way that most of the other things that the West exports particularly do the opposite. So there is one universal message which is a releasing and a liberating message because of what it actually offers, and that's the, the grace of God in Christ. We could go on there. This obviously, this first section, raises the problem that many people have with contextualization. It's the danger that when you go into another culture, 
and try to relate the culture, you might in fact fall into syncretism, mixing incompatible aspects of another religious system with the true teaching or practices of the gospel message. Syncretism that distorts the truth of the gospel must be recognized as a threat and be guarded against in all contextualization. The tendency to, toward syncretization, though, is common in all cultures. As we relate the good news meaningfully and rele <coughs> relevantly to the worldview assumptions, the value systems and beliefs of any cultural context, we are forced to make decisions about the extent to which aspects of the local cultural heritage can faithfully express or incorporate the gospel. This is never straightforward, since cultures are dynamic, developing reality, realities. Appropriate contextualization in one setting at one time may be seen as serious syncretism from another perspective at another time. Western theology regularly syncretizes the gospel with <coughs> the West's individualistic, materialistic and rationalistic re-readings of biblical texts. We should not be surprised then to find other cultural traits favored in other cultural contexts. Moreover, human nature proves us all more capable, more able and ready to see syncretistic tendencies in other people's adaptations than we do in our own. And so those of us who are concerned about syncretism need to learn to see the way it works in our own society um, and deal with it as a good basis for actually then becoming much more sympathetic to those who try to grapple with it in their own. The scriptures, the first part of this Paul's, answer, Paul's letter, say that there's one message, it's the message of Jesus Christ received by faith on the basis of his work at the cross. Anything other than that is not the good news. So he lays this very clear foundation. We must beware of the wrong kind of additional message that it's so easy to bring, which distorts the message. All right, he goes on in the second section, um, having said that grasping the one apostolic message is the source of our authority. And he says, the second principle is that we are to welcome the justified of all cultures as equally accepted by God and socially welcome in a cross-cultural hospitality situation. The Judaizing delegation from Jerusalem came to Syria and they polarized the Antioch church ethnically. You remember what happened? Folk who had Jewish Christians who had previously been meeting with the Gentile Christians both around the Lord's table and in each other's homes withdrew from that kind of open fellowship with people of other cultures because the Jewish Delegation from Jerusalem had said, oh, what are you Jews doing eating with Gentiles? They're not ceremonially clean. And even Peter and Barnabas thought it was better to keep the peace with the delegation than to do what they'd been doing previously and keep on eating with the Gentiles. Andrew Wall sets out the situation like this. One of the features of life in the Jesus community in Jerusalem had been that the followers of Jesus took every opportunity to eat together. What was to happen? when there were also Gentile followers of Jesus, uncircumcised, following Hellenistic eating, pa eating patterns, would it still be the mark of the followers of Jesus that they ate together? The test was the meal table, and clearly many old believers found it difficult to break the tradition of centuries and sit at table with fellow servants of the Messiah who still bore all the marks of their alien background. What could be defended on grounds of theological principle sometimes demanded great resolution in the face of peer pressure. Thus Peter can argue from traditional premises for the liberty of Gentile believers when he goes to, it, to Jerusalem in Acts 15, but he find it more convenient not to share a table with them when there was a chance of being observed by his home constituency when he's in Antioch. The shared table was the acid test. It stood for diverse humanity redeemed by Christ and sharing in him. Now this is a very interesting because what it's actually saying, and you remember how Paul reacted to Peter and Barnabas, Paul came and he said to them, you are not walking straight in line with the gospel if you don't eat with the people of other cultures. Paul says your social behavior is the evidence of whether you've understood the gospel or not. Who you eat with shows if you've understood what Jesus was doing when he died on the cross. 
And most of us in the West have never thought about this. Because most of us around our meal tables much prefer those who are like us, who are properly dressed and shaved and washed and wear proper clothes, um, and, and who you know, are not you know, dirty and untidy in the way they eat their food. We want people we're comfortable with in our ta- around our table. And Paul says, yes, and therefore you haven't understood what Christ did for you when he died on the cross. You get the point? If it is only the grace of God and the free, undeserved, justifying declaration of pardon from God as our judge in the light of what Jesus did for us that makes me right with God, well then why do I have to insist or why can I, how can I insist that anybody else from another culture has to add all sorts of other things before they're good enough to come and share with me? This is the problem they were grappling, grappling with. Whom we invite to our home as guests indicates whether or not we have contextualized the essence of the gospel. Adequate contextualization doesn't, doesn't just agree with the dominant culture's religious rules and take the easy road out and, and, and follow those rules. The gospel takes up the cause of those who are pushed to one side by those rules. The well contextualized gospel respects and upholds the perspective of the minority culture when it comes to sharing and social fellowship in the church. In this way, the gospel also provides a unique basis for respecting cultural diversity without hegemonic domination. This is good news indeed for both the global resurgences of indigenous identity and the longings of post-modernity for integrity in communal relationships. Why do we insist that hippies or folk with tats or with um, you know, earrings and things on have to you know, cover them up or perhaps even take them off before they can come to the breaking of bread. Um, we, all of us do these kinds of things. The point that Paul's making is that valid contextualising leads to a lifestyle consistency across cultural barriers. Contextualizers aim, or contextualization's aim is that our hearers will act in line with the gospel. This practical goal offers an important test for all suggested contextualization. Do the suggested meanings or principles apply biculturally and multiculturally, particularly in the area of social relations and hospitalities? I find it a good question these days when I'm in our New Zealand assembly and discussions and debates are going on about what we should or shouldn't do to ask the question, if we make this decision, will it include my brothers from Papua New Guinea or would I actually be excommunicating them by following this pattern? And if the latter is the case, clearly the decision is not right. All right, the third point, he says, we need to maintain through faith both ongoing dependence on the spirit and sharing in our adoptive heritage of faith. Galatians chapter 3, after there's been that strong clarification of the fact that it's only by justification, by, it's only justification by faith that makes anybody right in chapter 2. He comes in chapter 3 and in the beginning of the chapter he has those first five verses saying, don't you remember how the Spirit of God released and freed you? You actually met and experienced, you saw the Spirit of God working amongst you. Now you wanted to go back to to legal ways and and restrictions of laws instead of the living relationship with the Spirit. What's happened? And then he goes straight from there to remind them of the way in which they have put faith in God's word in exactly the way that Abraham did and that Abraham was justified before God by doing. It was Abraham's faith in God's word that made him right with God. And so in chapter 3, Paul spells out again the fact that The way of faith has, in fact, always been the way of being right with God. And so it comes back to this. He also makes that beautiful comment in verse 7 of chapter 3. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. We have received Abraham's heritage as our heritage. We have received because we're adopted into the family of Christ, we've received that whole heritage of all that had gone on in the history of the Jewish people as part of our heritage, as we talked about um, the other day. But that can be a bit of an embarrassment because 
having to integrate our own cultural history with the history of the Bible sometimes causes a lot of clashes. We in the West, of course, find it very embarrassing to try to relate the message of Genesis, particularly to scientific discussion about the, the origins of the universe and so on. And so we try to ignore it as often as we can or we put very clear divisions between it. Our heritage of faith um, doesn't mix quickly with the heritage of our education and our Western presuppositions. In the same way, our Maori people in New Zealand, our indigenous people in New Zealand, their mythology and their explanations of the way in which the universe came about they have very clear uh, stories explaining all of that. And it's a real challenge to integrate those or see how they relate to the biblical story of creation. And part of the challenge of um, bringing the gospel into any culture is how it deals with um, the traditional cultural stories and how they relate to the authority and to the instructions of the scriptures. But this adoptive heritage has a, an important value of another kind because... When we're grappling with this very issue of how do you relate the gospel to the new culture, often it seems that it's just the foreigner with his views over the local people with their views. But when I've got a, an adoptive heritage over here in the scriptures and they've got the same adoptive heritage in the scriptures, it allows us, instead of arguing with each other, to actually talk about how we understand the adoptive heritage and it allows us to actually be a lot more open and a lot more frank about how does that adoptive heritage guide us and how we take the new message and relate it into our culture. You see what I mean? It provides an external point of reference which allows us to have a third party, as it were, instead of just a two-way dialogue and argument, we can have a proper discussion which allows us to hear how God speaks in the light of that whole heritage that has brought to us. And so the biblical adoptive heritage changes the stand, the stance from which we approach different cultural perspectives as we work at contextualization. Instead of having a conflict between the dominant and minority cultures, we have a common ground together as believers in our shared adoptive past. This means we can listen to each other as we both struggle to relate the demands of our biblical faith into our own culture. Both cultures sit under biblical scrutiny in the contextualization process. As Andrew Wall sums it up again, since none of us can read the scriptures without cultural blinkers of some sort, the great advantage, the great excitement which our own era of church history has over all others is the possibility that we may be able to read them together. And if we all sit down together and come to that adoptive heritage, the word of God and the scriptures, we can actually hear what each other is saying in a fresh and new way. And that's the way to go forward. Now, this is the implication of the things which Paul's saying there in those first 18 verses of chapter 3. His fourth um, major principle or concern is that in contextualizing, we should respect the proper role of the local cultural and religious heritage. What he's just said, that Abraham was put right by faith, everybody is put right by faith, caused a major problem for any Jewish Christian if this is the first time they'd heard it. And the problem they've had is there, right, stated clearly in verse 19 of chapter 3. What then was the purpose of the law? If we're all made right by faith, well then, what about the law of Moses? What about our religious history as Jews? What about our great heritage? Where does that fit in? And this is the, another aspect of the missiological challenge of new convert, converts coming to Christ. Inevitably, they ask the question, or usually it's their children, actually, the second generation ask it, well, what about our heritage? Do we have to just forget everything that went before in terms of all of what the ancestors did for us and all of the things that have gone on before? Does the history for our people only begin when the good news came to us? Was God not here working previously? How do we understand our past in the light of the coming of the gospel is the question he's raised here. And contextualization has to grapple with that. So it's important to see what Paul actually says. Just going through very quickly. The law was given, Paul says, because of transgressions. Human nature needs to be shown right and wrong. Without rules and warnings, we go way off track. We transgress. So he says that like a Roman slave appointed to guard and ensure the owner's children turn up for instruction, the law constantly watched over the Jews and 
defining the depth and seriousness of their sin problem. You know the Roman custom, the slave would take the child to the, the school in, in many situations and stand at the back of the room with a great long rod, a great big cane. And if the, his child, if the child he's looking after is the um, paedagogos, is the advisor of the child, starts to fall asleep, crack, there's a, comes down the cane, and um, there's a prod in the back if he's starting to look around and do other things. And so the paedagogos, the, the person who's superintending, protecting, looking after the child, and make sure that the instruction you know, sinks in. Um, it's amazing what a little bit of prod in the back does for stimulating the brain. Um, and he says, that's exactly how the, what the law was doing for the Jewish people. God gave it to protect them, and to teach them, and to prepare them, is the other thing he goes on to say, for their Messiah. The law pointed to the human need for something more than the law. The law showed that it could tell you what was right and wrong, but it couldn't give you life. In the same way that we respect the work of a teacher, I hope, and we respect the work of a policeman, but we don't look to them for salvation. We know the limits of teachers and policemen. So Paul's saying the law has those protective and instructive roles, but it's not salvific. It can't give you salvation. And he says this very clearly. So... He sets out this idea of preparatory role, protective role, instructive role for the law, and all of those things are significant and important. But if that's how the traditional or the religious heritage of the Jews worked, what about the religious heritage of the other half of the Galatian churches who had come from a primal religious background and who had previously followed the teachings of elemental spirit forces and believe that spirit powers and the ancestors controlled everything that, that they did. Do they have to just reject all of that now? Or is there some way of understanding that past as well? Well, Paul addresses this as he goes into chapter 4. In chapter 4, he adds to the preparatory, protective and instructive ideas with a, another idea about the law. He says, as I read to you before, the law is like um, guardians. Guardians who look after an underage child until they come of age. And in verse 3, he sums it up and he says, So, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Now, you can argue all day on that verse. What does the we mean? Is he saying we Jews or is he saying we Christians? But he's saying at least to the Jews. Let's just start there. At least to the Jews, he's saying, we were like underage children when we were under the law. We were under the restrictive and controlling, guarding power of the law. And he says, that law served as the elemental spirits of the universe to us. And he uses a term that Paul knows is ambiguous. The Jews would immediately say, that's right, the elemental spirits is a reference to the ABCs, the fundamental elements of the law. So they see him as saying more about the law. But Paul knows, and it becomes explicit in verses 8 and 9, that the Gentiles in this congregation, the moment they hear elemental spirits of the universe, they think of all that they have believed about elemental spirits was about spirit powers, the spirits of the ancestors, the spirits of the bush. For the Greeks amongst them, they believe that there are spirits controlling the air, the wind, the air and wind, the water and fire. What have I missed out? From rock, earth. They believe that they were the elements of the earth, the elements of the whole universe, and there were spirit forces behind guiding and controlling the whole cosmos through those four, four elements. And half of his congregation immediately thinks not of the Jewish law, but of their philosophy, of their previous ways of thinking. And Paul, the converted Pharisee, says, what the law did for my people, the elemental spirits did for your people as well. And the we becomes explicit in verses 8 and 9 where he says, now that you've come to Christ, don't go back to the elemental spirits that were not gods, although they claimed to be gods. They had no deity inherent in them. They had only the, they were weak and beggarly. They had some power. A beggar can actually be rich if something happens. What has to happen for a beggar to be rich? 
People have to give him something. He's got no riches inherently in himself. He's empty, he's just a beggar. But if all the people going past give him more and more, he could become rich quite quickly, and in fact, some beggars do. Um, and that's an interesting description of these elemental spirits. They're like beggars. They demand your obedience. They demand your worship. They ask that you give them things, that is, that you follow everything they say, because they have nothing in themselves. But when you do give them your obedience, they become powerful. When you do bow before them and follow them, they can control you. And Paul says, you've come to Christ the reality. Don't go back to those elemental spirit ways of doing things. And he's saying to the Jewish part of the community, don't go back to your law. But he's saying equally clearly, you who've come from a primal religious background, you need to understand that your traditional religious views, your belief in spirits has been doing the same thing for you as the law was doing for um, the Jews. Now, you say it's the first time you've ever heard anybody saying this. Well, just in case you think I'm way out on a beam here, let's go back to our brethren authority. And F.F. F. Bruce sums it up like this. After a very careful discussion, where he's, I've been following his argument, in fact, in all I've just said, he sums it up like this. He says, the stoikaya, these elemental spirits of the universe. Stoikaya, it is now made plain in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 4 not only regulated the Jewish way of life under the law, they also regulated the pagan way of life in the service of the gods that were no gods. For all the basic differences between Judaism and paganism both involve subjection to the same elemental forces. This is an amazing statement for a former Pharisee to make, yet Paul makes it not as an exaggeration in the heat of argument, but in the deliberate, as the deliberate expression of a carefully thought out position. Paul has defined limits to the value of Jewish traditional religion, but in doing so, he has retained a proper respect for the role, for the law's role in regulating society and in preparing for the gospel. He's then attributed the same roles to the traditional belief systems of other non Jewish cultures. In these respects, at least, the Apostle recognises a positive role for pre-Christian cultural values. This suggests that in the contextualization process, we should have a healthy respect for the way local or traditional religions can reveal to their adherents their need as humans and thus point toward Christ. We can expect to gain real insight into the thought world of others and into the diverse ways in which human sin and human hopes operate in different cultures by a proper study of their religious ideas. This is vital for effective contextualization. This aspect of the teaching of Galatians offers a way for us to move beyond misjudging another's cultural, another culture's religions. It challenges us to listen and learn before we criticize and blame. And I think that's something we need to think about Clearly, Christ is the fulfiller of the desires of all nations. So we should understand the desires of those nations and see how Christ fulfills them and brings them to completion. The cultural heritage is not replaced by some other person's cultural heritage. It's renewed, it's converted, it's transformed, and a new understanding of it is brought by the coming of the gospel. One of the biggest tasks and the hardest tasks for each new culture is to reinterpret, rewrite, restudy their own history, especially their religious history, in the light of the fulfillment in Christ. And as many of you will know, some of the greatest writings in the history of our European nations did exactly that. Have any of you read the history of the Franks? Where does the history of the French people begin? If you read the great book, The History of the Franks, it starts with Adam and shows where um, Lyon and um, Paris uh, fit into the story of Adam. If you follow through far enough, it's about the fifth or sixth chapter that you finally get to France. Um, and, and that's an important insight. In fact, that's what Bede was doing with the ecclesiastical history of Britain. And you can go through a whole lot of our European histories. We haven't found ourselves as Christian nations until we've rewritten our history in light of the, Christ, the heritage of the faith. And this is what's happening in, in Africa today. This is what's happening in, in the Pacific today. At last, 
younger scholars are beginning to see how their history now fits into what God's been doing right through the, the progression of time. And we need to stand with and encourage them in the process as they're doing it. Okay. The fifth thing that he says, and we can move more quickly through these. I'm sorry I've spent a long time there, but I suspect some of you might think that's important to discuss. In the last part of chapter 4, he says, Living up to our dignity as Christ's family and not reverting to the previous cultural norms follows from what I've just been saying. There's clearly a danger in what I've just been saying if you give too much honour to the past. But having clearly said there's a proper place for the law and a proper place for the traditional religions, because of what he said in verses 4 to 7 of chapter 4, how God sent his son to redeem us and sent his spirit to indwell us and adopt us into the family of God, those two acts of redemption and adoption have so transformed us that now we're on the other side of the salvation of Christ. The danger is to go back to where we were beforehand. And once you've moved from depending on kerosene lamps and you've got a continual power supply every day with electric lights, you don't go every night and relight the lamps and read under the lamp instead of turning the light on. And it's the same thing he's saying here. Now that you're in the light, now that you've received the fullness in Christ, don't go back again to the way you were before you found him. So there's a balance between respecting traditional cultures and not reverting to them. There's a difference between them and Paul makes that difference very clear. And good contextualization does as well. All right. I've skipped over as I got to this part of chapter Five, or we're almost on the verge of going to chapter 5 of Galatians, there's a series of major things I've made no comment about. So we pause for a moment just to pick up on those. There's a series of teachings reminding us that we need to sustain in contextualization our vital, Christ-centered and cruciform redemptive encounter with Christ through the Spirit. And already at this point in the letter, there have been a series of metaphors describing the work of Christ on the cross. There's been the rescue metaphor in chapter 1, verse 4. We've been rescued from the present evil age by Christ. The whole justification pattern of Christ being the one who puts us right in the presence of the judge because of our faith in him. The redemption uh, process where he has brought us out of the powers of the spirits, the powers of the previous law, the powers of those things which held us in subjection before. And there's been a strong emphasis also on the fact that we've now been united with Christ. We've died with him. He died for me and I died with him, according to Galatians 2.20. This Christ-centred, um, the cross-centred experience where we actually joined into the effects of the cross in our own Christian life. And the challenge is that as we present the other aspects of the gospel, we're making sure that it comes into focus around an evangelical experience of living faith with Christ. Now, we haven't got time, so we'll skip over the hymn this morning. Um, and we come to his next point, where in chapter 5 he says, we need to find and express our freedom in Christ so as to enjoy our own cultural integrity and freely serve others. In chapter 5, he says, For freedom Christ has make you, made you free, so don't go back into any kinds of bondage again. And he tells us that neither circumcision or circumcision doesn't count for anything. It's faith working in love that is important. And he then goes on and says, But if you've been made free, you've got a choice. You're a released prisoner. You've been set free. You're out of the prison. What are you going to do now? Live for self or live to serve others? And he gives this radical challenge about how we're going to live in and freely serve others or use our freedom just to indulge the flesh. And he warns very clearly about the danger of um, doing the latter. So he goes on from uh, there to the expand on that where he says that we need to allow the spirit to transform our personal, our social and our communal lifestyles because there's a battle between the flesh and and the spirit. He introduces it, he outlines the way in which the works of the flesh operate and work, and then he challenges, challenges us because we're in Christ to demonstrate the fruit of the spirit in and through our lives. Notice the list of things he lists as being the works of the flesh there. 
Um, in Papua New Guinea, it's really interesting to see that it says in verse 19, the acts of the sinful nature are, ob- are obvious. Sexual immorality, well that obviously comes from our flesh. Impurity, and my dirty mind's clearly associated with my flesh. And debauchery, just going out and getting drunk every weekend, that's clearly all about my flesh. And he says, idolatry and witchcraft. But just a moment, witchcraft is where the spirits do things. Paul says, no, 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 witchcraft is a work of the flesh. Now think that through for a while, because this is good news. It's the power we give to the belief in spirit forces that gives the spirits their force and their ability to do things in witchcraft. We're the ones who can determine whether or not witchcraft functions. It's a work of our flesh that surrenders our wills to them and allows them to work in and through us. If our wills, if our flesh is actually under the domination of the Spirit of God, there's no place for the spirits, the other spirits, to distort and to abuse and to lead into wrong ways. And so the human part of witchcraft needs to be picked up and dealt with strongly. We're grappling with this very seriously in Papua New Guinea today where there's been a a real resurgence of witchcraft after many years where the gospel had genuinely seen it put aside. But with the third, fourth generation folk, there's a return to the old ways um, without the old ways of restraining witchcraft and now it's just going ahead and causing all sorts of problems. And part of the problem is that people say, but it's all of the spirits. I can't do anything about it. I can't stop it. The spirits are doing it. Well, the Bible says, oh, just a moment, Witchcraft is part of the works of the flesh, so there is much that you can do about it. Hear me clearly, I'm not saying there's no such thing as witchcraft. I've seen too much in Papua New Guinea to say that ever. But what I do about it and how I respond to it has an awful lot to do about how it affects me and my family and our church and other people. And so it's important to see that there's a a human element in the way witchcraft works and to bring witchcraft back under the works of the flesh would be an important contribution of the church to deal with some of the problems that witchcraft cause in our modern nations. All right, we could go on. I put that in there because it's something we're grappling with in PNG. The challenge is to learn to live in step with the spirit in the light of the new life that we've received in Christ. And then the final sections... um, at the end or at the beginning of um, chapter 6, he's talked about the social implications of allowing the Spirit to rule our life and the transformations that brings. And then, as always, in verse 11, Paul picks up the stylus and starts writing some of the letters. And there's a, he says, notice how, my, how the letters have changed. They've all got big now because I can't do them the proper way. And he finishes up and sums up what he's been saying. He's saying that it's Christ-centred renewal not cultural colonialism that you need. He says, these people who are coming to you, these false teachers, all they want is to be able to count your numbers and say how many people they've got following them. They're not willing to pay the cost of suffering for Christ, and that's a pretty good test. And so he challenges them to, challenges us to look for the, mis- the motives of the false teachers. He talks about the cross in three ways in that last paragraph that you can look at closely. And he sums the whole letter up in two sentences in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 6. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is new life, is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. You are the Israel of God. You are the ones who can claim to be the true people of God. That's not replacement theology. That's the meaning of the title, Israel of God. Where have we got to in our thinking? What I'm suggesting is that if we want to do contextualization effectively, then we've got to try to hold those nine things together. We've got to foster apostolic loyalty and stick with the given scriptures. We need to promote justification that brings equality, equity and social relationships and hospitality. We need to uphold a living relationship with the Holy Spirit and continuity with our adoptive heritage of faith, not just going off with our totally new ideas. We need to respect the cultural and religious heritage of 
the cultures we've brought the gospel to. We need to ensure daily life in Christ's family, not reversion to old bondages. We need to sustain the evangelical, redemptive, purposeful encounter personally with Christ through the Holy Spirit. We need to facilitate freedom to serve others with love within diverse cultures. And we need to guide toward transformational response to the Holy Spirit within each culture and to enable the new life in Christ which unites us as his new people. Does what I'm doing in explaining the meaning and encouraging contextualization of the gospel follow that mix of tests? Some of us are very good at one or another, but it's a big challenge to hold all of those things into a proper balance like the letter does as a whole.